Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Vegan Spirituality Online Gathering. Um, I'm your, one of the co-hosts. My name is Lisa Levinson, and I co-host with Judy Carmen, and she'll be introducing herself shortly. I'm the director of the Sustainable Activism Campaign for Indefensive Animals. And a program, one of the programs we have is to support animal activists uh, emotionally and spiritually. So we have this Vegan Spirituality Online Gathering once a month. And this month, we're really excited to feature filmmaker Thomas Jackson of The Compassion Project. And Judy will give more details about Thomas. And if you're online, you're probably able to see all three of us in the little video screens. And if you're on the phone, we're so glad to have you. And we're excited to have everyone, actually. So this call that we have every month is really an effort to create and build a vegan spirituality community. We do have uh, groups that meet in person across the country in about 20 different areas, and you can find out more about those groups and possibly join one in your area uh, by visiting veganspirituality.com. And this effort is to explore veganism as a spiritual practice. So thanks to everyone for joining us, and if you would like to start one of those events in your town or city, you can contact us at veganspirituality at gmail.com. So we have other projects that we do in combination with sustainable activism. Uh, we have uh, vegan spirituality retreats, and we are so excited. We're going to be offering one in the Milwaukee area in September, and we'll be offering one in Florida next April at Jungle Friends. So we're, we'll keep you posted about all of those wonderful events coming up. And we also have events called Compassion Fest, which are uh, an opportunity to do spiritual outreach to the larger community. We'll have one of those in New Haven, Connecticut in July and um, in New Jersey as well. I don't have the date on that yet. So I'll keep you posted and you can also check out our uh, events page on the Vegan Spirituality website. And so we do offer other support services for animal activists, such as a animal activist uh, helpline. And the number for that is 1-800-705-0425. And we have an animal activist online support group, which is kind of a similar format to this, but we talk about issues that we face as animal activists. And that will happen actually, um, I believe that is the next Thursday coming up, or actually two Thursdays on the 28th of the month. So that's what we have to offer for everyone. And we're so excited and very grateful to be able to bring this program to you this evening. So without any further ado, I'll let Judy take over here. Well, thanks, Lisa. Hi, everybody. I'm Judy Carmen. Um, I wrote a book called Peace to All Beings. And so this whole subject of vegan spirituality is near and dear to my heart. And I'm so thrilled, like Lisa is, to have Thomas Jackson with us tonight. And uh, you all are, are just going to love this whole thing, I know. He's got so much to tell us, and he's working on the Compassion Project, which we're going to hear about. Um, Thomas is an award-winning filmmaker, photographer, and musician. He received his master's degree from Florida State University's prestigious College of Motion Picture Arts, where his thesis film, Slow Dancing Down the Aisles of the Quick Check, won both the Student Academy and Emmy Awards, as well as 20 other awards and honors. So we're very lucky to have him helping with animal activism through his film. Um, the film's screenplay and an interview with Thomas is included in the fourth edition of the book, Crafting Short Screenplays That Connect. Uh, he recently directed the feature film Minds, the Gap, which is currently in post-production. Thomas has lived and worked in New York, Nashville, and L.A., and currently resides in North Florida, working as a photographer and a digital media artist. Lots of skills. Um, he became a vegan in 2005 while living in Manhattan. However, it wasn't until the birth of his daughter in 2012 that he became what he calls activated and found his passion and purpose in helping to create a more compassionate, peaceful world to leave his daughter and the children of all species, no matter, no matter who they are, um, a peaceful world. 
at the moment, his purpose is taking shape as a documentary, and that's what we're so excited to hear about, that he's putting together, currently titled The Compassion Project. After the documentary is complete, he hopes to expand the project into a social movement Mm -hmm. in which people may continue to share and add to the message of compassion and create viable ways to take that message out into their community through books, podcasts, new video content, workshops, events, etc., while remaining connected to a compassion-centered community via his Facebook page and website. Do we have that on there? Yes, we do. So for anyone who's online, we have the, um, we put into the chat box uh, the links for uh, the website of Thomas's website and also for the Facebook page. So you can scroll there. And for anybody who's on the phone, we will be sending an email after this event that will include a replay link for the event and all the other links to the things that we're describing. So you'll you'll get the information just just like the other people who are online now. Yeah. And while while I have the it'll be written down in an email. Yeah. And also if anyone has any tech concerns, I'm that's part of my role here. So if you can't hear properly or something's going on or um you know just know that I'm monitoring the chat box and you can certainly let us know uh if you need any assistance. And our call will be in interview and then after that we'll have a Q&A session and during that time <clears throat> I'll reorganize um, the the format here so that everyone can unmute themselves and ask questions if they'd like to so we have a really interactive program for this evening yeah thanks yeah I know there will be a lot of questions um, and to start out Thomas I, I think <coughs> everyone would love to know uh, how <coughs> your journey to become vegan took place and how the birth of your daughter activated you. How did that happen? And, and also, what is her name? What's your daughter's name? Her name is Melody. Melody. Oh, oh, Melody. <laughs> yeah. Like she's had a melody like she's she can sing and pick up any melody from an early, early age. So wow. it's very appropriate. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, um, before I do, I just want to thank you both and everybody for being here tonight. Uh And uh, thank you for this this, um, gathering. Like I haven't been, this is the first live one I've done, but I've watched them over the last few months and you've had some awesome guests. And um, I mean, it's really informed myself and the documentary itself. So thank you for uh, having this every month. Thank you. (laughs) Well, my um, I grew up in a in South Georgia in the seventies, and um, never heard vegetarian, never heard the word until I was in college. And um, I, I mean, I I was at a time where I can remember my grandmother like wringing the necks of chickens, and um, mm. I think one of the most traumatic things that happened um, when I was ten or something is. I had, well, my cousins lived far away and they had rabbits when we came to visit them and they gave me a couple that I could have. And so we brought them back to my home and we had them for a while. And my cousins them came to visit and uh, somehow it was going to, they were going to, I guess what they were doing is they were raising rabbits for me. And my cousin mm-hmm. who was 15 at the time who uh, would go and um, spend every Saturday, every two months or something like killing rabbits 10 at a time with a hammer, like killed my two rabbits in front of me. Mm. Now at the time, at the time I had, you know, all these men, Southern men around me and it just felt like this lesson of like, this is life, son. This is, you know, God put these animals here. Nobody really spoke this out loud, but this is how it felt. It felt like they were telling me, you know, they were really conditioning me for this life. And, um, to the point that that night they served the rabbit, you know, and like I, you know, it was a tough thing, but I ate the rabbit. I ate a piece, a little piece, because it was just like everybody and their mother was like around the table just saying, you know, this is life, this is life. So, uh, but I've always had an affinity with animals and, you know, I've I've known a lot of animals. That, and um, so that was a just kind of a going to sleep. It's kind of like, 
I've seen my daughter mm. sometime where she doesn't want to hear something. Maybe <laughs> she'll say, I'm going to go to sleep, you know, whatever. And I think a part of me, like inside, was kind of put to sleep at that time. But in um, college, I was in film school. I had a position as a first AD on this film, and they needed a pick for the film. And this, I was in Tallahassee, and I grew up in Bainbridge right up the road. So I called my mom and them, and they said, there's this place where they auction off the animals, you know. So I went and got a baby pig for them. And I had the pig just long enough to, maybe overnight, and then took it to them. And uh, it just like, it, something inside reminded me like, this is not right. And so I kind of became vegetarian. Like I didn't really know at the time, I still didn't know any vegetarian. And it was at a time we didn't have the same kind of things around. So I was just like, okay, I'm just going to have the pizza without the pepperoni or whatever, you know, like, and, um, and I was in film school working, you know, getting three hours sleep a night, but then I ended up getting this relationship. And at some point it fell away. And I went back to sleep for a while. But in New York City, when I lived there, well, I started like meditating and, and um, I guess when I was in, I was in Nashville for a while, then I went to LA, then to New York. And in Nashville, I got a book on Kundalini and um, LA, I discovered Deepak Chopra and some other meditation. Mm -hmm. Then in New York, I um, found Unity of New York and I started doing meditations and classes and and I, you know, and then the thing that really sealed the deal is that I had my mom had met somebody at a YMCA class and their daughter had used to live in New York. You know, this was in Georgia. She met him and her daughter was no longer there, but she put us in connection. Her daughter was coming to visit. She came to visit. She took me to this Indian restaurant on Sixth Street down in the East mm. Village and she ordered vegetarian. And I was like, wait a second, you know, I'm in New York City. That wouldn't be that hard. And I ordered something vegetarian that I was eating and going, what am I doing? Like it click right then vegetarian. You know, I didn't know, I didn't know what a vegan was. I didn't, you know, I still had no idea what the, what the uh, dairy and the egg industry was doing. I mean, but I could feel energetically. I was shifting in that way through my spiritual work. It was all very interconnected. Um, and so it was only a few weeks. I think I was, I was in a deli somewhere and I was like, um, you know, may, is that vegetarian? They're like, yeah. They said, are you full-fledged vegan? Like the guy behind the counter wasn't a vegan or anything, but he was like, are you full -fledged? I said, what's that? And they said, well, they don't have any animal products. And a light went off. Yes, I am that. And from that moment on, <laughs> it, was like, it was no question. You know, it was like, no brainer. I don't have to hurt animals at all. And there is, you know, if people are, if people are not eating this, there must be something wrong with it. And, you know, I... So, but at the same time, from that moment on, I've been like a vegan in a sea of omnivores. I've never really had a vegan community. At Unity, um, at the time, I believe the teachings were really influencing me. But we would go to brunch, you know, and these teachers and the people would, friends and all, they were very compassionate, mm -hmm. loving people. I would see what they were ordering and see that they, they weren't mm -hmm. making any connection whatsoever. And it all, and at that point, that's where the document, the seed of the documentary started at that point. But it took me a while. And at the time I'm going, Hey, you know, I'm new on this spiritual path in some ways. I mean, I've been, my whole life has been a spiritual path. Like I but it started as Southern Baptist and, uh, which had its own interesting path of getting to where I am now. But, um, I was just, I'm not qualified to tell this guy who's teaching me this now, you know, years later, I hear Will Tuttle talking about the, Charles and Myrtle, which I heard a lot of talk about Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, who started the Unity. I've heard a lot of talk about them at Unity during those classes, but nobody ever said, hey, they were vegans. They were strict vegetarians and they preached this as part of their, or, you know, it's part of their message. It was part of their, you know, you to, uh, to really reach your heights as a spiritual being on this planet. You have to really do no harm on all levels and they were teaching that and to me like discovering that years later it was interesting to me that their teachings of that was getting through even though the teachers were not teaching that part of their message their overall message was so powerful about the connection of everything and how our thoughts and our actions affect everything um that you know it's to make the connection to okay my action is i'm going out and buying a cheeseburger 
And when I buy that cheeseburger, somebody's going to kill that cow, you know, or I'm going to do that. Like that connection is the next evolutionary step. Or it's, it's the natural connection. If you're teaching what they were teaching, that's what it was. So I would say that um, that's how the how it came. But at the same time, as a vegan in a sea of omnivores, I've been very quiet, you know, and like people, I, the, I did have great friends at Unity that would go to vegetarian restaurants with me and that, uh, you know, and we're very supportive. Like, I found it like in the South, everybody, a lot of people may not be religious, but most of them are, uh, if you're, they're going to be respectful of religious people. <laughs> so at the Unity people, if they see you're vegan, you know, they're going to be respectful of it because they understand on some level that you are really living and walking the walk and talking the talk and you're living your compassion, you're living the message that you're being given fully. So uh, that's how I became vegan. But I, it wasn't until my daughter was born, honestly, that I felt like I had to, it was a few things. Two weeks after my daughter was born, her sister's um, dad was in a, was murdered in this weird way. And, mm -hmm. and that kind of put everything on a different level for all of us, you know, and for me, you know, really brought home the impermanence of life. Here's this guy like 10 years younger than I am. And he, you know, his daughters lost him in an instant, you know, and so it really brought home that I need to cherish every minute I have my daughter and I need to really maximize and the quality of that time. And, um, and but a year, but with about a year later, my, the mother and I had se we separated. A lot of things, you know, came down the pike as a result of many things like that. But especially the death of the father, I believe. And and um, and at that point, um, my her my daughter's mother is not a vegan. She was like a vegan when I met her. She was a vegetarian for many years, transitioned to a vegan, and it that point she's not a vegan and and on many levels so about um nutrition and different things so it employed me to like do a lot of research and i probably gathered about 50 60 pages worth of research and created and summed it all down to like i think seven pages and it was all broken into levels you know everything from you know the uh impact of environmentally and health wise and spiritual wise and just uh just i mean everything backed up but just enough to where you get the idea but in that research is where the seeds of all this happen um and the other thing with my daughter is having my daughter and living in a sea of omnivores i wanted to find a vegan community so i started reaching out to the local vegan community and the first meetup they had was a screening of cowspiracy and I went to see that and that right there like blew the top off of everything for me. Like I had no idea environmentally, you know, this was at the beginning of the research. I had no idea environmentally. Uh, most of my research up to that point had been about health. Everything shifted when I saw that movie. And also um, it really um, made me think, you know, I've got a daughter and she's going to have a daughter. And I, you know, if we don't have the water, we don't have this. There's going to be wars. I'm going to be suffering. And it's like, there's no need for this you know seeing cowspiracies you can see just immediately immediately environmentally what we can do and so um i began to pray and meditate at that time i was just getting ready to direct this feature and um but at the same time i was feeling like this feature wasn't really addressing any of the issues of what's going on so i started praying and meditate what is it i can do what is it purposely i can do that would be of value and uh, that question popped in my mind again like how can compassionate people and because the thing is is like i feel like people who are spiritual they they, they have a caring uh, center immediately they, they it automatically to them it's um you you have a beginning starting point and then when i did a little google and found out that 80 percent of the world considers themselves spiritual or religious you know, I was like, yeah, you know, this is really an important subject that needs to be discussed. And uh, and so, yeah, after that meditation and everything coming about, um, you know, that was the beginning. That's how it all started. Wow. So you 
you are really dedicated, and we need you. The animals need you. It's wonderful to have you on board, my goodness. And your story, I think a lot of people that are listening have, have had similar experiences with loving animals and then going to sleep thinking that's what we have to do and then waking up. And it's wonderful to be awake. So tell us about your Compassion Project. What is uh, this, where is it in, in its, uh, you know, in uh, as far as how far along you are with it and uh, what are your plans with it? Well, right now <clears throat> we have uh, interviewed Dr. Will Tuttle and we've interviewed um, um, Victoria Moran and we both, we also have footage of both of them speaking at different places. Um, We've edited together a sneak peek. We've gathered together about eight other people, and we have two or three other people we're reaching out to that aren't on the website yet. If you look on our website, you can go to uh, people who are contributing. Lisa is going to be somebody we're interviewing as well. Um, um, and maybe Judy. I don't know. I'm going to be out at the uh, in L.A. at the at the major conference this year, and hopefully oh, get some major people to, to lend their voices because it really is about adding voices and letting you know like when I did start the research especially once I realized what the subject was you know it started slowly it was about spirituality and veganism spirituality and veganism then I was in New York shooting b-roll for the film we had made and Victoria was up there and I started the interview process and actually through the meditation one of the things happened first it's like okay so you first get the idea of like okay I'm going to make a film. Well, I've made films, and I'm going to tell you they are not the easiest thing to put, put together. There's a lot of work in what you do, and so it's always a little scary to say, I'm going to commit to this thing, uh, knowing that, you know, for a while, it's just going to be work, 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 and before anybody even knows what's happening. But so the first thing I did is, like, meditate. Okay, well, what's the first step? Well, right away, Victoria Moran popped in my mind. Now, she... <laughs> is somebody, when I was at Unity in New York, I was volunteer coordinator for the uh, for Unity for the last, I think four or five years I was in New York. And uh, she came and spoke, the first time she ever spoke at Unity in New York at the symphony space. And I met her and I met her husband. And at the time, you know, he had just finished this one screenplay and they were just about to start this story about a cow that escaped the slaughterhouse, Miss Liberty, which now they're, they're fun, you know, they're partially funded and they're, ready to shoot so um so yeah she i met her and all of that well years later when i i wanted to connect with the vegan community and wanted to learn more i searched podcasts because i found podcasts when i'm working or this i can listen to podcasts and it's nice and i found i saw victoria's picture pop up i'm like oh that's victoria <laughs> let me pop on her podcast mm -hmm. and her podcast was full of like these amazing mm -hmm. people and since it's on unity of new york or unity radio it's um got spiritually themed guests a lot of times. And so it was just like, for me, I just would sit there and take notes as people were like, oh, and that's how I found most of everybody just about that uh, I'm interviewing is hearing them speak on her show and go, you know, I could take exactly what they said and take pieces here and there of everybody and make a little documentary out of, out of that. And so the, meditation approach uh, Victoria well I approached her and she was you know excited about it and also you know at the time I had reconnected via listening to her podcast and calling in so I could get a subscription to the vegan society and and it happened to be a, a, a filmmaker that day or a writer and we talked about film again and she brought up her husband's screenplay that she had joined as a co-writer at that point and uh, she we wrote our numbers down and she sent me the screenplay and so we reconnected in that way and then you know like six months a year later I, the idea came and then when i was up there interviewing her she one of the things she said is that all the major religions have compassion as their major component all the way home on the airplane and all the way that just kept going in my mind you know and that was when i said you know compassion that's what it's the compassion probably that's what it's all about it really is about getting people mm -hmm. to reconnect with their compassion so that's when it started and then the other idea of um, once I had the idea of like, okay, once we have these interviews done, we can actually bring other people in and offer them a chance to have a compassionate 30-day uh, trial or, you know, or a <laughs> challenge. Um, and also, 
you know, find out just, I don't want to say put people on the spot because I, that's not a nice thing. Like I believe like whoever comes in, I have compassion for it. And my belief is when I ask myself the question, why aren't more spiritual people vegan? <laughs> it's because I don't think people know the details. And you know what? If you take an earthlings, most people are not going to watch that, that don't want to know at all. Cause that's powerful. Like I, it's hard like to watch and I, but it really opens the door. But um, so I think you have to come in another another angle. I think Cowspiracy did that beautifully, you know, really bringing home the fact. And I think having people from different spiritual paths talking about how veganism is in alignment with their path, even though there may be things in their text that may be contradictory. There's reasons for that. There are people who have studied these texts, you know, like you had Keith Akers on. He's an amazing mm -hmm. writer and the research he's done has been very, you know, influential. To my work and a lot of people's work, so um, I think that um, that that we have the voices. We just need to put them all together and try to make it and find a story that's entertaining, keep people engaged, and uh, and uh, hopefully the years of filmmaking will help with that. And and my my knowledge is is that when you come into this process, you really don't, you just like, I, I have to come in and be open to just ask questions and be, learn new things. And from that, let it lead me to where we're going because I have ideas and I've written down all my ideas, but I, my experience teaches me that, you know, somebody's going to come in and say that magical thing that's going to change the direction. It's like um, in the interview with Dr. Tuttle, one of our the little sneak peeks we cut together is called the good shepherd and uh he had said this one thing that uh mm. in that we'll we'll watch that in a minute and you'll hear what he said but he, he said that one thing and the moment he said it i almost like wanted to jump him down like i knew like he had just said something very powerful and very and and in a clever beautiful way and um that brings it home and and um and sure enough i was editing the main promo and that I just said, let me just start a timeline and put that one thing he said on there. And I had finished that before I even finished the promo. It was just like that little inspiration. And there were several things he said in that interview, by the way, that had me wanting to dance up and down inside, you know, that, <laughs> that I'm holding on to that you have to see mm -hmm. the film, you know, like, cause I can't, you can't give it all away. And some people it's, let's just put it this way. He says a lot of truth. And some people may not be ready for the truth. You got to ease it in, in the middle of these other um, subplots you have woven um, mm -hmm. and other people speaking, you know, like um, those one liners. Cause the one thing about Cowspiracy and the one thing like I keep in mind when I do these interviews now is when Howard Lyman said, you can't be an environmentalist and still eat meat. Like that was powerful. That was like zig me. Um, you know, and so that's the line I'm looking for in every interview from that spiritual perspective. And, and Dr. Tuttle gave it in the way he describes uh, you're not being able to live the golden rule and still eat animal products. That That's impossible. You know, there's a little of that in both of these uh, trailers, I think. But he, he expands on that even more. And... Uh, which makes sense, you know, like when I heard him, his interview and the things he was saying about metaphysics of food and everything, like I'd never heard anybody say those things. And, but they were things like I was feeling from the beginning. And, mm -hmm. um, and so it was really nice and refreshing to hear him say that. That's great. So, a lot of things fit together when you were talking to him, it sounds like. And, oh, yeah. And it sounds like it, it's really developed just mm -hmm. uh, kind of with your intuition and the things that happen as you talk to people and it's it's going to be so um, did you say we're going to see a clip? Yeah we can uh, I think Lisa has a couple of clips maybe yeah. we can start with the um, the the one that says I think the highest form of love yeah okay so one moment, the highest form of love. And by the way, we did actually put all of these links in the chat box. So if you'd like to, you can copy that from your chat box and you could also watch these later. Um, and if you're on the phone, as I mentioned, we'll 
we'll send these to you. So here we go. We're going to put this in here. Um, we'll take just a moment. There's a little lag time on the videos, but we're grateful we get to see all of this. So I'm going to go ahead and um, play this video. So you may see on your screen that there's a little image, and then we'll push play, and you guys can enjoy it. We're killing 75 million animals every single day for food. I mean, this is not a little side project of our culture. This takes enormous resources. Most of the land, most of the water, most of the petroleum, most of everything is going to that. One of the important points, I think, about the idea of compassion is that it's more than feeling a sense of empathy for the suffering of others. Uh, it is that, that's part of it. But compassion, by definition, goes beyond that to an active yearning to somehow reduce the suffering of others. In this way, uh, compassion may very well be the highest form of love in the sense that it's, it's the, uh, a loving feeling coupled with a yearning to actually translate that feeling into action. Being compassionate to one another and expanding that compassion out to all that has life is the true essence of spirituality. So if the teaching is not to do unto others what I would not want to have done to me, then that is a clear clarion call to go vegan, which is a beautiful thing to say, I'm gonna live my life as, a, as an expression of the spiritual impulse that is at the very core of my religion and of all world religions. Oh, that was a very moving video clip. For those of you who are on the phone, you'll be able to access it a little bit later. Um, but thank you so much for recommending that we, we show that. And if you are with us online, Please, you know, let us know in the chat box what you think, and and you know, we'd love to have some of your comments. You know, watching that that reminds me of the other thing. When I came home from the New York trip, I looked up compassion, and that was the thing that really sealed the deal. The definition was a two part. It was the whole idea of having um, having empathy for someone suffering, but then the second part that seemed to be lacking in most people was the. Uh, overwhelming desire to alleviate the suffering to the point of making changes and choices you know like it feels like most people think compassion is just the empathy part but no there's a second part you have to fulfill both to really fulfill that compassion i think yeah, yeah and i think that um one of the reasons we feel like our community is so important for support is because when we have that empathy for other animals and open up to it completely, um, then it can be very hard. There can be hard times knowing what's happening to the animals and, and an overwhelming desire, like you said, to, to do something about it. So beautiful clip. And I wanted to ask, Thomas, um, I think I read somewhere that you might also interview spiritual teachers who are not vegan. Are you thinking about doing that? Well, that's the second part. That. That's the second part. And that's what uh -huh. I think we would all love to see. That's the part <laughs> where I was saying that I would not want to, I wanted to come with compassion. I really, I mean, I want to go to um, a dairy. I want to go to a chicken farm. Like I see these, when I go visit my mom in Georgia, I pass them, like, you know, like my dad, like I pass uh, near my dad is a dairy farm and my mom's a chicken farm, you know, so um, I want to go in there. I want to have the people tell me because I know that these are caring, compassionate people. They just have a part of themselves and shut down and gone to sleep, just like a part of myself was shut down and go to sleep. And the thing that's really going back to the rabbit thing, I don't my cousin who um, who I. I nobody really remembers that incident. <laughs> like my mom and my dad, I called them and they're like, yeah, I don't remember that happening, you know, and my cousin, when I called him, he said, I don't remember that exactly happening, but uh, I don't doubt it because we were doing that at that time. And he said he was doing it, the you know, 10 rabbits at a time at this thing. And so I was thinking at 15 and he had the stuttering thing too. And I was thinking, 
the things that you have to like at that age you have to suppress within yourself must mm -hmm. be uh, traumatic because I, I wasn't I didn't have to hit them like that would have been another level mm -hmm. and thank goodness right. I didn't you know right so yeah yeah so many kids in 4-H who we've learned have really been traumatized by falling yeah. in love with their animals and then finding out that they have to sell them to yeah. slaughter. Very traumatic. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and we have to remember, too, like, the compassion we have as the animals. We love animals no matter what they do. You know, there there are carnivores that have the teeth and have the gut and are meant to be carnivores and we love them and we protect them. Um, we all know, like if you do the research, that uh, humans are not that cut out to be that, like in no way or shape or form. And it's we can see it in our society, in the health of our society. We can see it in the health epidemics. We can see it all around us. We are not meant to eat this way. We're just not meant to do it. And when we have, when we force animals who are not meant to do that too, hey there, woo, I, I can't help it, uh, Rocco, Rocco. When we force a animals. Chico. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, a different, oh, say, so, okay. It's a, Chico? Okay. Chico. So I've met Rocco and Chico. But when we force, uh, when we force animals to, uh, I don't even remember what I was saying now because I'm like, hey. <laughs> he's he he's wants beautiful. to better stage here. <laughs> he would like but, he would like to get to know everyone. <laughs> yeah. But he may have the, something very important to say to us too. That's right. Um he oh. but we are not carnivores. I mean, you know, period. Um and so I um feel that we have the other thing I'll say about the documentaries is that we've had some really good documentaries um, and there's a lot of good information out there that's done in a way that's entertaining for people to see. And we're lucky and fortunate for that. Um, when I look around, I see like Earthlings is the example of like, this is how horrible it is. We have several in the health, you know, we have every forks over knives and food matters and that sick and nearly dead or whatever. We have a lot of good ones and, and we're about to have what the health, which is very exciting. Um, mm. I can't wait for that one. Um, and we have them on, um, on the, the environment now, but right. especially with Cowspiracy, but I really have been ye learn yearning to have somebody talk about the spiritual aspect that includes all of those things, because on a spiritual level, you know, the environment matters because that's the creator's creation. And um, and your body and health matters because that's the temple. That's the temple of the spirit. And if you're putting death and putting putting energy of misery and sorrow and these animals who have been a, been tortured in such a way, you know, like if you're putting that in your body, like on some level beyond what we're seeing physically, it is affecting us emotionally. Okay. Is it affecting us um, uh, mentally and always? I think like I know the more I open my compassion up, the more I feel my, I'm open to myself and to my emotion and to my spiritual connection to the point where there was a point, even as a vegan, like we live in South Florida and there are certain little critters that come in the house. And so there were small ones that at times, you know, I would set out things that weren't good for their health. <laughs> but now, you know, like uh, when I started like, and I catch and release most things. There were just little things that I'm like, oh man, there's so many, like a million fruit flies. Every day I come home, there's more fruit. What are you gonna do with those things? Like, so uh, it was it was tough. And I asked Dr. Tuttle about that in the interview because I really wanted to say, how far does our compassion go? <laughs> you know? And, uh, but once in the past, like I always release, I catch a lot of poisonous snakes around here. I catch a lot of uh, mice and things. And I've always taken and good places and let these people go. But there were little bitty things that sometime I wasn't as compassionate with. And once I opened up that compassion, I really like something shifted in a way that really expediated the karma or the whatever, the, the feeling of energy and the connectedness to all things to the point now, like I really love the fact that this is fruit fly time and I don't have any fruit flies because I have learned it's very simple to create a jar with a little cone in it put some rotten fruit in it and they'll all go into that jar. If you do the cone right, they can't come out. 
take them out you know, away from your house, you let them go. And guess what? They go have beautiful lives. Take them to your compost. They love the compost, you know? So there's another way. We don't have to have one or the other. You can make it all work if you really pray and meditate. To me, like the meditation and the prayer are when the, when things start coming through and then you're like, okay, this is the next step. You know, this is where we go from here. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the whole spiritual aspect looks like you said, over the whole thing, environment, health, and the animals. It, it and we're a world hunger. Together. And yes. And, and the world hunger, the connection the of other issues. humans suffering and the suffering of the, the workers in those conditions. Like they're, Compassion and compassion for ourselves, you know, like compassion is all, all those levels. It, mm -hmm. it, it just touches everything in our lives. If we mm -hmm. touch our, if we open our compassion fully, it will touch everything in your life. You will get an opportunity. I, when I lived in New York, I remember waking up, I would meditate before I left my apartment. I said, give me a chance to love somebody today. And people on the subway would come up to you and you would have a chance to love somebody. There was this sweet old man who was in his 90s. And I met him one that first time I did the prayer. And I rode with him all the way to town. He doesn't normally go down there, but he goes down there. He told me all these stories, all these jokes, you know, and, and it was beautiful. And then I met him again, like a few weeks later, and his memory wasn't there. So he told me the same things over <laughs> in the same ride. And so it became like, to me, it was like this perfect groundhog day where I was able to, when he would tell his stories, I was able to really entertain, interact with him because, oh yeah, I've heard that, <laughs> you know, and, and dialogue with him about it. And so it did brighten his day. You'd see him come alive, you know, interaction with people, even, it's just amazing what can happen. And so I think opening your compassion is the first mm -hmm. step. And like, I mean, even having that compassion is the reason you would ask, what can I do today? What can I do to love? Because you know what? If you go out there and love that person, that energy is going to come right back to you. And when you're doing that and the, and the light's coming through you, it's coming through you. It's, um, you're getting it too. I remember when I was watching that clip earlier, when you saw the, the happy things with the animals, I remember and people helping her, that's particularly when she was giving the water to the pigs, oh. I felt this thing released inside of me. And I remember the late Dr. Wayne Dyer, who was very influential in the, some of my, like some of the lessons I learned about the law of attraction and different things, like opening the door to certain things. But he, one of the things he had talked about was when someone does an act of kindness, if they, they, they've tested this on your body, like, and, like dopamine or something in your brain is released when somebody does something nice to you and <clears throat> they test it in the person that's doing something nice dopamine is released in their brain but <laughs> what really seals at home is that the when they test the person who just watched the transaction dopamine have released in their brain so when you walk around living compassion and trying to be loving everything around you physically will be shifting in a positive way you will be bringing vibrations and i'm going to tell you i am first to tell you i am not the master of this at all i was um i have a i get busy i have a three-year-old you know i have all these things going on i am not always totally present in this moment uh, but when you are present and you can just be with the person and feel their energy and share that moment whatever that may be and you have that loving just inside that intention of like, you know, namaste, or I wish you well, even if you don't say it, you know, peace, love, and like in LA, I remember seeing that in some book, I don't remember which book when I was living out there, and it was just like, um, say a little blessing to everybody you see, a silent blessing, and I used to go around LA everywhere I went, and just everybody I saw, even if they didn't make eye contact with, I'm like, I wish them peace, love, and joy, you know, peace, love, and joy, peace, love, and joy, and, I was, and guess what, I was feeling peace, love, and joy. <laughs> It was, yeah. you, give, you give it, it comes back. You know, that's kind of the whole spiritual aspect of everything. All religion talks about the um, karma right. or golden rule. Well, and I think a lot of people have come to understand that and are trying to practice that, but they haven't quite realized that the amazing thing that will happen to them when they do that with animals and that's what you are going to be teaching here with your film. So this is really going to be great. I'm just wondering, Lisa, do we have some questions? 
Well, um, it, what we can do is we can open it up. Yeah, we can open it up for a Q&A with anyone who'd like to ask a question. And okay. this might be a good time to do that. So if anybody uh, does have a question, you can either write it in the chat box or um, in a moment I'll switch the format and then you'll be able to press star six if you're on the phone to actually call in and speak with us. So, um, and then I think also there were a couple of other little pieces of footage. So let us know, uh, Thomas, if you wanted to, to take a peek at those. So I'll start, um, we have a first uh, question which is on the, uh, in the chat box and then I'll, I'll uh, open it up for people on the phone. The first question is, um, where can we get the film and where is it being released? Um, and so the before Nazi you answer that, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll actually you answer that first and then I'll change the format after that because there'll be a little break. So go ahead. Okay. Um, hopefully in the not too distant future. I mean, right now I have the people I want to interview. It's just a matter of getting to the people getting the footage and cutting it all together, uh, getting the rights to whatever music or footage we use that we don't shoot. Luckily, there's a lot of cool filmmakers out there that I'm trying to connect with that are vegan that maybe have some footage we can use mm. for just cre credit in the film. Um, what were the first step in this um, is in May, at some point in May, we're going to start a little crowdfunding campaign. There's a, I think I'm going to go with uh, crowd gifting because it has, even the name of the site has a little Buddhist connotation. So it has a very natural, it feels like it fits the film. Uh, and we're going to raise some money. We've got to, I mean, unfortunately, I wish that I was independently wealthy and could just make this movie. This is one of those out of my comfort zone things that I'm really having to do, um, which is say, hey, you know, people, can you please help me get the money I need to get out there, get the film edited and get it to their, you know, certain festivals and honestly i'm to the point i would just like it to be available to people you know um so i'm not exactly sure how the distribution part will go there's several there's so many different ways to distrib distribute or have distribution now if um if at all possible i mean you know i'm hoping it can even if it has a short little distribution area i hope that we can make it available to everybody because some of the things i want to do is make it where if somebody wants to have a little, share it with their pastor or share it with their other people in their church or in their yoga studio or wherever it may be that they can get a copy and they can share it, you know, because it's really for me about opening as many hearts as possible, getting it in front of as mm -hmm. many eyes as possible. And I promise you, if you, if you uh, go to our website and you, uh, if you sign up for updates, I don't do a lot of updates, and when I do, I try to keep it short. Um, you will be updated about every step along the way. Um, so please, that's the thing I would say, like if to help support this film, go ahead and sign up for updates, share the website, get people to sign up, like the Facebook page, let's build the crowd. That's what, you know, I'm doing my research too <laughs> on how to do it. And the research is really network, you know, we have all these fantastic mm -hmm. people that, and I encourage you to go look at the people who are going to be speaking, look at their bios. And we have a few more surprises we're hoping we'll say yes, that will be tops, you know, be like, wow. So, um, so yeah, look at the people and um, let's build the crowd. So even if you're not able to, because I trust me, I understand, like there's a lot of things I'd love to support financially that I'm not able to. So even if you're not able to do that, your energy of like thoughts and prayers and your energy of, um, sharing and liking and getting the word out will be very important. We're about to start looking for uh, someone who to do a social media. I, I don't do any, I don't know how to tweet, tweet, whatever it's called. So we're looking for somebody who loves to do that and who would like to coordinate all of our social media, help get the word out. And um, although we can't really pay right now, we can give you a lot of love and we can give you a credit in the film. Uh, so we're going to be sending out information on that and other ways people can help uh, with their talents and their skills. And that the other thing in every kind of contact, I try to say like, and tonight, like if you have ideas, if you if you feel motivated, hey, you know, I find a way I can serve this or help this cause along. I have this talent, please. You know, I'm a good uh, designer and I want to design you a beautiful logo. Hey, if you feel motivated, I this is not Thomas Jackson's project. It's the Compassion Project. <laughs> 
it's like we're all this everybody who supports in this and we're going to have some good like everybody who contributes we're going to have ways that you'll get thanked and different gifts and we're going to find a way to make this where we'll make it together and when you contribute you're contributing your energy even like i said even if it's not financially your prayers and your like i used to ride the subway in new york too and i'd just sit there and meditate and just have my eyes closed and just feel the divine light just shooting every direction you know and just like everybody on that car having a blessing like the more you can sit and send your blessings out in the world i think the more they'll surround you and be there for you and just that's 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 a long answer i don't know when the film will be finished but i'm ready i have everything i need except the finances to get to the people to make this film okay i didn't have the skills i've been trained i didn't realize i've been training for a long time for this project i didn't you know like i made a feature film last year but it was not the same this is like my purpose and when this film's over there is this everything i do the rest of my life i feel has to have some kind of connection to making this world a better world for all beings mm, wow yeah. it's so beautiful it is. so what we can do so, is go to your website and sign mm -hmm. up and mm -hmm. uh and the facebook like the facebook and share that and uh hopefully donate to uh the project yes right yeah any okay. any support any ideas anything you have you feel led to do that's how i okay. feel and, and if you want to watch that that little um good shepherds 41 mm -hmm. seconds we could watch that if you want and then um before we leave we'll watch that other prayer the animal prayer sure now um Okay, or unless we'll we have that. questions, we, whatever you want to do. Yeah. We, well, we probably have some questions, but why don't we we'll show the video and then we'll ask if there's any questions. How about that? So yeah. this video is, um, which is the one that you'd like to show? The Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd. Okay. So hold on just a moment. I'll get that, get that put together. And we do have a couple of interesting comments in the chat box for anybody who's, who's with us there. And um, we can address those in a moment. We'll all be able to watch it together. Hey. The shepherd is taking care of the sheep so that then later he can stand over them with a knife and cut their throats and eat them. And so the idea that the Lord is my shepherd, that's a very terrifying thought if you actually think about it. So we have to realize that Jesus was about questioning all of this and saying the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. There's no way we could ever eat meat, dairy products, and eggs and ever say that we're following the golden rule. Mm, wow, powerful. Okay. Yeah. yeah. When he said that thing about the shepherd in the interview, when he said, you know, um, how scary it would be, I was like, oh, holy cow, that's, that's yeah. true. Like, you know, I've never really thought about it that way, but that's Yeah, so there's true. language like that, that, that I think helps people stay asleep. And um, I'm noticing this comment over here, someone said about interviewing religious people and asking them why they exclude animals from moral consideration. I was at a church, a um, fairly Bible-believing church, a few weeks ago, and they were talking about having a pig roast and, for the congregation, and I said, you know, I'm um, awesome. pretty sure Jesus was a vegan. <laughs> and <laughs> uh, do you think that, that this would be a Christian thing to do? And they're just... Nobody that was within earshot could say anything. It was like, okay, let's talk about something else. <laughs> it just mm. fell on mm. asleep, asleep ears. Yeah. It was like well, it I, was such a foreign concept. There was no way to respond. But yes. maybe it planted a seed. You can always hope. I think just the energy, your presence, making the... You know, I think that even if we don't say anything, I think holding that compassion, I think it comes across. I think osmosisly, yeah. it sinks. It sinks. Just that we please. are all connected. By the way, we all are connected. Yeah. You know, and we all possess that part of spirit 
that Jesus and God and the or who you know Buddha, everybody, we all have that same spark in us, and they could walk around and their energy affect and change things. We could tap into that energy too. I'm not saying right. that we're going to walk around and be Jesus. That's not the idea, but the idea is, is to just really realize he told us these things I do, you can do and more. So uh, he was not saying, he was saying you can do whatever you believe and it's within your heart and the kingdom is now. There's no like kingdom in the future. There's, he was saying it's now. The kingdom mm -hmm. is now. You have to live it. You can't like say, well, because the other thing that, I get in conversations with people about the environment, you know, and if there's some religious people, they'll be like, well, God's going to fix it all. And I'm like, and I just want to go, okay, wait a second. These, these are the hands of God. God has mm -hmm. no other hands on this planet than your hands and my hands, mm -hmm. you know, so it's not going to happen without God working through us in this mm -hmm. physical world. So you just have to agree to let that happen. You have to say, what can I do? How many people like when you if you really go in and learn to meditate and then start asking that question, what can I do to make this a better world? What can I do to serve purpose and to live my life to the utmost reason that I could ever be here? What is that thing? You know, and, and then say, what's the first step? You know, it, if it's like, OK, well, to save the planet or to whatever, like you have to just take one step at a time. And it may just be reading that book or going to that group or meeting these people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And just to address the, comment, the question in there real quick, the question about a, sure. approaching religious people. Yes, that's the purpose yeah. of the second part of the interviews. Once we interview the other people, I want to cut together little bitty videos for each path, each spiritual path. I want to take all of those videos from the spiritual path and I want to get the um, have each one available. So when we do the interviews, we interview the people about their compassion, how their spirituality affects their compassion, how they use it in their life. Then we start asking them, you know, the certain questions about their diet or this or that. And then we ask them to watch this, or we just go right and watch this. And then we say, you know, how does that affect you? I have a whole series of different kind of second round questions. And the other thing too is part of this is a survey. I wanna do the survey called the Cal survey. Right now it's just one kind of question. Because my idea that most people don't know what's going on is is in this survey. When my mom and my stepdad, who are in their 70s, uh, they were the first people I asked this because I was just curious. You know, they're in the, live in the South, you know, and all this. And I was like, did you know, it's just this one question. Did you know that in order to have milk, a female cow had to be forcefully impregnated and her baby taken away from her so you can have that milk within the first 24 hours? No. My step that was like, I don't think that's true. I need to ask the farmers. I mean, even myself as a vegan, it was later in my veganness that I even realized that cows don't just have milk. The only person who's kind of answered that question is my daughter's 12 year old sister, who like first said, really? Oh yeah, because she, her sister had just been nursing and she had nursed and she knew her mom didn't nurse in between. Like, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, okay. <laughs> But most people don't wow. know that. So, yeah, I think it's really about putting the facts in front of people and then asking them, how do they feel about it? And, and you know, and offering them the second, the last part that came was offering them the challenge. First of all, everybody who comes as a non-vegan will get a packet that's a compassionate living packet. It will have things about the vegan diet. It will have things about prayer, meditation. It will have certain things. And we'll offer them a 30-day challenge where in the challenge, it's not just having a vegan diet. It's about turning off any violence, quit watching all the TV we watch, quit doing this, watch these documentaries. Uh, one of the things, like, honestly, I just this year, just a few months ago, went to my first farm sanctuary. I've met a lot of animals, farm animals, but they've ne I've never met them, a freed farm animal. It, I was like, holy cow, this is like amazing. I've seen video, but it's a way like different thing. You meet this incredible thing. And so one of the things is, is they all have to go to a farm sanctuary, <laughs> you know, like you, they have to make <laughs> that connection. So if they're willing to take it, you know, I'm going to try, there's a local doctor I'm going to try to get to work with us and monitor people's health and check in twice a week. So we are going to try to get people to do this part of the program too, whether they be, because we're not just going after the leaders, we're going after everybody who considers themselves religious. I know a lot of people who do yoga and who are, who are Krishnas and things like that, mm -hmm. that still, are missing the boat mm -hmm. on that. So, mm -hmm. wow. Well, Thomas, I think this idea of this compassion, the challenge, the 30 day challenge to challenge your compassion is really 
um, clever. And it, there's a lot of vegan 30-day challenges, but adding this element <clears throat> of compassion to it is, is very profound, and I think it gives you a tool to really reach out to those communities like the yoga community and um, the uh, possibly the New Age spiritual community, or there, there's a whole wide variety of these groups that um, many of us have interacted with and, and been surprised that they weren't um, embracing all living beings as part of their compassion. So I think that's really interesting. I'd love to, to um, help you get that out into the world. Um, and I wanted to also just let people know it is, it is about six o'clock, or actually everybody's in a different time zone, so we're towards the end of our program, but we, I still want to offer the opportunity if anyone would like to ask questions uh, online, so we'll switch the format, and if you'd like to stay with us, we'll be here for probably another um, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, depending on how many questions people have, and uh, also I'd like to uh, let folks know that our next um, our sustainable activism webinar, which we have once a month, actually, um, Anita Krajnik, who is in charge of the Toronto Pig Faith um, organization, she's the one who gives the pigs water on their way to slaughter, and she's very inspired by Tolstoy. It will be kind of a spiritually motivated sustainable activism webinar, and I encourage you to check that out. It'll be the first Thursday in May, and then the next Thursday, we'll have a gal with us who does uh, has a hands-on healing project for humans and animals, and that'll be fascinating. It's like an emergency room with energy healing for animals. So we'll have her speaking with us in, in May. Um, so I'm going to change the format now, and that you'll hear a little announcement. All attendees are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. So that means anyone on the phone can join us in this conversation by pressing star six. And if you're on the computer, you can go to the icon next to your name, the little microphone, and you can unmute yourself and then just chat with us here for a few minutes. Hey there. Hi. Who's hey. this? Hey, this is Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Hey, I just wanted to share this really quick. This has been so great, but I am... Um, I guess I saw this online, and I just wanted to, I'm going to send some ideas to you on Facebook and stuff, but before I forget, I think this is a really good, cool one. It's these Buddhist monk, and they're called um, Dharma for Animals. And yes. It's we, like really yes. neat. If you guys yes. haven't heard about that, have you heard about yes. that? Yes, one of our one Oh, of I the just thought that was so cool. Yeah, one of the people we're interviewing is the founder of that, uh, Bob Isaacson. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Okay. Great. No, so great much. suggestion. So I, think you're, I think you're right on the mark. Great suggestion. Yeah, so that's awesome. awesome. Thank you. I mean, yeah. I just love all this. It's so beautiful. And thanks for saying that, Judy, too, about what happened with you. And, yeah, I just feel all this. It's so, so great. I'll let you guys go. Back to the next question. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Cheryl. Yes, actually, um, Bob Isaacson is a dear friend of mine as well, and um, we'd love to interview him on this show. He actually leads a sangha at this time, so he leads a, a Buddhist meditation. Um, but it's great to have him as part of the Compassion Project. Anybody yeah. else have a question? Would like to pop on either on the phone or on the, um, the chat box? I hear somebody. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Um. If somebody's ready, you just pop on and say your name. Hi. Hi. Well, sometimes it's hard to tell. <laughs> um, yeah. People are on. So let's see here. Hold on, guys. We got a little, little sound. Um, so I'll just uh, work on that technically. Hold on a second, gang. Um, hang on, gang. We'll just see. I'm just gonna move that. Nope, wasn't it? Okay. Well, let's go. We'll go on to a. 
see another question that's in the chat box. I think I might change the format so we can not have the, that noise there. Um, oh, I think I wonder what that go was. Away? Um, yeah, it's I fun. think that was okay. That might have been somebody's. Uh, everyone's in their own different area with different levels of noise, so it could have been just something like that. Um, I wanted to mention that there's a really interesting comment in the chat box about the 4-H club. So mm -hmm. um, this uh, Melissa is sharing that she she used to go to the county fairs and have a, a moment where she communicated with the the people who brought in these um, the 4-H animals. And um, she would even spend time with them, like during the judging, and she would ask them, how is it that they can name these cows and care for them and love them and then sell them uh, to be slaughtered? And she mentioned that they had no response and they would just stare at her as if it didn't matter. Um, but inside she knew that it did matter and that um, they were conditioned or they had moments of falling asleep, I think, as, as Jack. Thomas Jackson was mentioning, um, and that waking up is a powerful thing. And um, I, I think this is a really key issue with the 4-H. It's something I'm really interested in myself. And I know um, from working with uh, um, people who are in recovery, I mentioned one of the gals had said she became vegetarian specifically because she was in the 4-H, and one of the saddest moments of her existence was watching the um, pig that she, she helped raise walk up the little ramp to the 4-H, you know, um, uh, to that fair area. And she knew in her heart that that pig was so upset and was turning around and looking at her, and she, that, was, that was it. She went vegetarian right there. So I think wow. that um, this is it's a profound what's going on with the, the children of our country in the 4-H club. Yeah. Well, and children being encouraged to hunt at early and early, mm -hmm. earlier and earlier ages also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm. So let's see if we have any other, and I don't know, Thomas, if you had anything you wanted to say about that. Well, you know, I, I totally relate. I grew up where there was a lot of 4-H and, and even now I have family who hunt and who have children that hunt. <laughs> so it's there. I totally, it breaks my heart, you know. One of the things we talked about before the show um, is sometimes when you do, do the, this activist work, you know, you really can feel as you open up, as you open up to the, as you clear out your body and you open up to your connection, you become more feeling of not only the good, but also the bad that's going on. And being able to really have that sense of compassion is not always a pleasant feeling. And I know it's tough for people. And that's why for me, like, you know, I, I have things in place, some meditation, some bike riding, exercise, being with a three-year-old, whatever it may be, you have to take care of yourself. And um, so, yeah, I think, um, it's important that we all find things that will that will feed our our spirits because mm -hmm. we all are connected. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I I love that idea. Um, you mentioned going to a farm sanctuary, to a animal sanctuary. That's a lovely way to heal our souls and to feel that oh, yes. compassion and connection. Yes. And there's mm -hmm. and there's many of them in so many areas that it, you can. Um, Google one in your area and just find one and, and go visit. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 A lot of people have become vegan just going to those sanctuaries. It's, mm -hmm. it's such a uh, revelatory experience to see that these animals are their, are their own beings, that mm -hmm. they're not just a herd in somebody's pasture. And you just go, well, you know, they're going to slaughter. That's my hamburger. Instead, they're like, wow, these animals are free to be themselves. And it's, it's just uh, life-changing for a lot of people. These, farm, mm -hmm. these sanctuaries are, are just wonderful that we have them, mm -hmm. not only to rescue animals that, that need to be rescued, but... 
to teach people who these animals really are. Yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. And we actually, one of the things we're going to do going forward is to have our vegan spirituality retreats at farm sanctuaries. So we do a blessing mm-hmm. of the animals as part of the retreat. And this will be a wonderful opportunity to make that connection, to actually be present with the, the animals that we advocate for. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah, I see, and I see a question in the chat mm-hmm. box from Melissa, mm-hmm. which is uh, asking, is, "Do you want to read it?" Sure. Um, how to respond when people tell her that they want to be vegan but they're too lazy, or that they feel, um, you know, but that they feel do feel sorry for the animals. First of all, I'll respond, thank you for having a conscience. <laughs> you know, thank you for being interested. Mm-hmm. That is a very important mm-hmm. thing. Uh, laziness, I think, you know, I think it's different motivation for different people, and we all kind of know that. Um, I have a friend who I kept talking about Cowspiracy for him to see, and he saw it, and he's like, oh, my God, I'm going to have to, I'm, I like to eat meat, but I'm going to have to give it up because it's hurting the planet. Like, you have the conversations with them. You keep it simple. You keep it short. You know what the, the major points are. And if they're open to talk, first of all, if they're open to it, that's great. Do everything you can. Ease yourself in without pushing them away. Um, start on what you think is their most interesting thing. If it's about the animals and talk about the animals, you know, find out what they know. You know, what do you know? What it, like? Because honestly, when you think about what happens to a baby calf when it's taken from its mother, it really, that's my answer to laziness. <laughs> you know, like you or mm-hmm. compassion will be so much more. And the other thing too, I'll tell you, is that the more you embrace the, not just a vegan diet, but a diet that is healthy and full of whole foods and a lot of veggies and greens, Important. your laziness will start moving away. Like there's <laughs> the processed the meat and different and the animal products in your body. Our bodies are not made for that. So it, it sticks in our bodies. It weighs us down. There's a lot of things that will shift. Your laziness will go away. But documentaries are a good thing. I mean, I have a theory that so many people are watching all this TV, TV, TV. And like if they would take twice a month and not watch the Kardashians, but watch Earthlings or, or not even Earthlings, watch because uh, if it's too much for them, watch Conspiracy. Watch this movie called The uh, Corporations. Anything that opens your mind to what's going on in, around you that you're being shut down to when you watch the media. The media is there to hypnotize you and put you to sleep so you don't question what's going on. The media is controlled by six different corporations. The whole media, they all have an agenda, you know, like this is another passionate subject of mine and I'm trying to find a way to work a little of this into there. I mean, I really want to keep it about the the passion, but you know, I, I guess there's another documentary about this other because it really, we have to wake up. We have, we have the power. We yeah. have the power. If we unify our power, we have the mm-hmm. power. These corporate, when you watch the corporations, you walk away knowing that corporations, they, the whole movie is comparing corporations to psychopaths. They, they meet the whole criteria. But you walk mm-hmm. away knowing that one thing about the reason we can control corporations is that they are programmed. They are designed to make money for their shareholders. No matter, like, if it makes them more money to pollute this land and they get lawsuits but they made more money they're going to go with the more money they have to they're financially responsible to make more money they're not financially responsible to make a better environment they are financially responsible to can because you you listen to people talk about the economy oh we got to make more we got to grow this we got to grow that we got to have more we get where are we going to get all this more at some point we got to wake up and say you know everybody doesn't need to work We're going to tear the planet apart trying to find work for everybody. Everybody doesn't need to work. We're technologically able to not do that. Why don't we have a society where people can, you know, why don't we look at other options? But to to say, I would just say one of the first things to do is get people to start watching things that will wake them up. You know, Mm -hmm. documentaries are entertaining. They're, They're little. I look at it like there's all these little people out there that have little pieces of the light. And they make these movies, and if you watch them, you're getting a piece here, a piece there, whatever. You know, we're all sharing the light, and we're all enlightening together. Yeah. You yeah. Know? And if we get 80% of the world to live their compassion, you will have a critical mass beyond critical mass, and it'll things will not be accepted that are accepted now, not just with the animals, but with people and and governments and corporations. Things will shift. It ha- they have to shift. They do. You know? Wow. 
And whether then, we're doing it while we're, we're whether we're in the life raft or in a boat in the in the planet sinking, one way or the other, things will have to shift. The evidence is there. We see the all around us. You know, it's like too many people are agreeing. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for sharing a bit about that angle too, because um, it's it's all related, as you said, and uh, I think it's good to be to wake up so we can all wake up these different parts of us. And I've really appreciated that that um, metaphor of when we're asleep and when we're awake and being self-reflective about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Thomas. Um, Anything else that either of you want to say before we close up our call? And I'm, I'm also thinking if you wanted to play the, the little, uh, the prayer, we were talking about doing a closing prayer, which we do, or, uh, um, and this, this is one that Thomas put together with Will Tuttle. And it's the prayer that I've talked about before on the circleofcompassion.org website where we, uh, Will and I started this, Will and Madeline and I started this quite a few years ago. And we now have this one prayer that we ask people around the world to say every day at noon. Um, It's translated into, I think, about 30 languages. And now Thomas has put together this beautiful uh, little video clip with Will saying the prayer and some beautiful Mm -hmm. pictures of animals. And it's really nice. And it's right on the front page of circleofcompassion.org. But we'll show it here so everybody can see it. And that'll be our prayer for tonight. So... And thank, well, thank you, you Julie. for everything that you have said and everything you're doing, and just you're just such an inspiration to all of us. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Here, I'm here so honored go. to be here tonight. Thank you. Oh. Yeah. So we'll we'll have an opportunity to watch the video, and then we'll um, perhaps say a group goodbye. Um, so I I'm personally really into the beginning of this video because it has a a toad and I started a toad detour project in Philadelphia. So I have a heart for toads. Yeah. (laughs) So here we go. Along with our outer efforts to protect and liberate animals, it's essential that we also work together to build an inner field of shared human consciousness, of compassion for animals. And so we have created the Worldwide Prayer Circle for Animals, where wherever we are, every day at noon, we say together this prayer, compassion encircles the earth for all beings everywhere. Compassion encircles the earth for all beings everywhere. We give thanks knowing this is so, and thank you for being part of this movement to help build a field of compassion for animals. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's beautiful. By the way, that's Dr. Dr. Tuttle's music, too. Very right. talented. Um, and his voice, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. <clears throat> a wonderful, wonderful. Voice. And, and and just one other thing about when I watch it, I, I was remembering that you saw the cow at the beginning, the calf, and then the calf nursing. But those are some shots that I got, and it's interesting how when you start down a journey, you don't know what roads it's going to take you, but it takes you down roads. I was coming back from that interviewing Dr. Tuttle, or recording him speaking this in Ocala. And I'd gone last time I was down there, I went to a farm sanctuary. Well, on the way back, I was going to get some footage of nature and stuff. And I saw this field and I stopped into this office. I guess they sell hay and food for, they had like rodeo and stuff on the side of their thing. But I went to ask them if I could take some video. And when I was in there, and you know, part of me is want to be judgmental. Oh, it's about rodeo. They're feeding these lives, you know. So, but I walked in there and there's this man in there. When I say, can I take pictures? He's like, um, and I saw him drive up around the same time. He's, I said, um, I, he said, what do you want to take pictures for? I said, well, I'm doing this documentary, you know, and it's I need pictures of animals in the uh, environment. He said, well, I have happen to have a cow sanctuary right down here. Well, I discovered this man. His name is Terry. 
and he's 60 something years old and i could do a whole show about this man he living mm -hmm. compassion doesn't know another vegetarian another vegan but 30 years ago somebody brought him two cows after the first night he went vegan without knowing what he was doing you know and he's been raising cows ever since he's got cows out there that are 25 years old that he's had since a baby he's got two cows he's got a cow when i was there that baby and another five week old one that because the bull had got out last year and he didn't know it and now some suddenly you know and they come in his house some of them had come in his house because they used to live in his house with his babies and he took them to like this non-denominal church this one that was sick when it was a baby and they all prayed for it and so i mean here's the thing about terry is i he needs he has no connection with any farm sanctuary at all he is health was bad last year i'm going to start up a fund for him and also try to find connect him to, cause he's less than a mile from that other farm sanctuary. I couldn't believe like he's right down the road from these things and he's worried about what happens. He's 60 in his sixties. He's worried about what happens to him. What's going to happen to his cows? You know, are they, Aww. we need to find a way to set all that up so he can let go when it's his time and know that those cows are not going to be slaughtered, that people are going to take care of them. So I'm going to make little bitty mini documentaries along the way about Terry. That's going to be some of the video content that if you sign up for our hey. website, you're going to see that first before we post it to everybody. And you can follow along our journey. I'm gonna take my daughter down there to meet the cows. She hasn't got to meet him yet and uh, get video of that and of Terry. And we're helping him with his diet because he, had, he hadn't been taking care of himself. So we're gonna do a whole thing about this wonderful, compassionate man. Oh, well, thank you, Thomas, for sharing yeah. that. And that kind of brings it home to all of us. And also, um, Diane wanted to say thanks so much to you, Thomas, for doing this film, and she can't wait to see it, and she will contribute towards your fund. And also, thanks to us for uh, hosting the webinar. So, and really, our thanks goes to thanks, all of Diane. you for being part of this community and joining together to have an opportunity to really explore what does it mean to be vegan as a spiritual practice to really hear like what thomas has to say and then see how it resonates in your heart and realize yeah this is who we are we are part of the same tribe and compassion that is really our um our, the watchword here of our faith if you would call it that is compassion so it's a, a real treat to have this be the discussion topic today. And if anybody's with us online, um, you're welcome to unmute yourself where we, so that we can say our group goodbye. It's a little tradition that we have. And thank you for joining us. And we hope you can join us again for our next Vegan Spirituality Online Gathering, um, second Thursday of the month. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. Have a wonderful thank evening. You. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Oh. I see. It's wonderful to hear your voices. <laughs> Bye, everyone.